it's often the case that that software architecture is viewed as a purely technical activity. This is something that engineers need to worry about. This is not something that an organization needs to worry about. But in fact, this is really an organizational activity. And so if we kind of step away from the term software architecture and we look at the role that systems play in an organization, then we can start to understand why it's important and the way in which organizations need to pay attention to the structure of the systems they build and the way in which they need to make sure that ultimately the systems they produce are aligned with their strategic objectives. So if we think about a product-oriented organization, let's say an organization like a cell phone company, maybe Nokia or, or uh, Samsung or some LG or some other cell phone company, we think about what their business model is and the way they make money. It's important for organizations like that to produce many innovative products. So if you have a working cell phone, the only reason you're going to buy another cell phone is because it's new and innovative. It has the coolest, latest features. It's got uh, maybe the battery life is better. Maybe the screen size is larger. Uh, in, in some other way, the hardware is more capable than, a previous, than the previous phone. And if you're an organization that will release the newest and latest phone, then you can charge a premium for it. So you think about Apple, every time Apple comes out with a new iPhone, they're very expensive. And they're very expensive for some period of time until in one way or another, competitive products come to the market and then the price starts to drop. And so Apple and other companies like that are only gonna stay in business if they can produce lots of products that are innovative and that will beat their competitors to the market with comparable features. That means that in order for them to be successful, they've got to somehow take their core software system and vary it. They've got to add new features. They've got to change the underlying hardware. They've got to do so in a way that will allow them to sell the, the, the new product for a competitive price. And the way that they structure their software is going to dictate how long it takes to add new hardware, how long it takes to remove one feature and add another feature. And that's going to dictate how much it costs and how many products they can, they can release to the market. So if you think about the process that an organization goes through, they're going to do some market research. They're going to identify some number of products. They don't come up with a, with a cell phone by accident. The cell phone is the result of a, a fairly significant amount of, of market analysis. So they've identified a target market. They understand what the competition currently offers. They understand what their envisioned product will offer their, their market. They understand uh, how much they would like to sell that product for. They understand how, how much they would like to make. So what kind of margin would they like to get for each unit that they sell? And they predict how many units they're going to sell. In order for them to realize that, their software has to be structured in a way that will allow them to add new features, to add the hardware quickly and easily enough to be able to charge that price, that target price, in order to be able to receive that margin. Otherwise, it's going to take them much longer to develop the software specifically for that product. It's going to take them much longer to release the product, and they're going to have to sell it for more or lose money. Uh, and perhaps their, their competitors are going to release a, a similar product before they do and their, their competitors will be able to charge a premium and they will lose market share. And so there's a relationship between the product portfolio or the product roadmap that a company has and the structure of their software. There's a number of things that need to happen in order for those things to be aligned. It's not the case that this will happen by accident. It's going to happen uh, um, from a uh, a set of a very precise, very coupled interactions. And so typically what will happen is an organization will come up with an initial product roadmap and uh, engineering will come up with some initial architectural roadmap. And they need to have some mechanism to translate between the language and strategy of business and the kinds of technical decisions. So if you talk to somebody who's responsible for the business and you talk about whether you should use an event-oriented mechanism or a message-based mechanism, it's not going to mean anything. But if you start to talk about whether you should trade off battery life for cost, that will mean something. The people that are responsible for the market and understand the market will, will be able to determine which is better from a market perspective. So if you do certain kinds of market analysis and you have 
a, you have a, uh, a different sort of business. Let's say you are now a, a mobile carrier, so you provide service for mobile users. If it's the case that you drop calls, you're going to upset your customer base. But your customer base will tolerate some amount of, of uh, um, continuity of service. So if you drop two calls per 100, it'll be okay. They won't go and change service. If you start to drop three calls per 100, then maybe they'll start to change services and go to their competitor. That sort of market analysis is needed in order to be able to provide the correct kinds of requirements uh, to be able to design a system to support the needs. Today, when we look at, at how we train engineers and how we train people that are responsible for the business, product managers and marketing people and so forth, there's a real disconnect. So the product managers and the marketing people will often look at features that you need. They, uh, um, they might look at some other capability like battery life and so forth, but they don't understand how to articulate that or communicate that to the engineers. The engineers also tend to look at functionality. They don't necessarily understand how to think about the structure of their system, how to think about the properties that are supported and inhibited, and what the relationship is between those properties and the needs of the business. And so what we need is some recognition on both sides that there are mutual dependencies between the decisions that you make in the business hand side and the kinds of decisions that you make from an engineering perspective. We also need organizationally some recognition that you're going to be constrained by the engineering activities, that the marketing people can ask for whatever they want, but once you try to design it, you'll start to see that you're limited in terms of what you can actually get when you're constrained by cost, when you're constrained by schedule and so forth. And so that you'll have to start making some very specific trade-offs. And you need some way to understand what the impact of technical trade-offs are on the business and how it is that you might refine your, your business objectives in order, to, in order to ensure that you can actually build it and get a system that's aligned. This might mean that in some cases you have a business strategy and a vision that you cannot actually achieve. And in those cases, you want to learn that as early as possible so that you can cancel and, and reformulate your strategy in order to, in order to uh, come up with, with something that's viable, with something that you can actually build. In order to achieve this, you're going to need a number of things. You're going to need business people that have some awareness of the dependency on on uh, engineering activities. You're going to need engineers that understand what the impact of their technical decisions are, and you're going to need some way to translate back and forth. In some cases, uh, it's the technical person that ends up being the, the sort of uh, interface between business people. So perhaps you have several markets that you're trying to serve by a single product, and, every, and the people who are responsible for these markets will all give requirements to the engineer and the engineer is left to make these kinds of trade-offs, which ends up being business decisions. And so that's not a position that an organization should be in. Uh, it's not a position that an engineer should be in. It's the case that the organization ought to understand which trade-offs are being made and what the impact is on the business. So you need some processes in place to manage all of those activities. And this is really the case regardless of, of industry. So if you rely on a software intensive system, then to some extent, you're going to be affected by the decisions that the engineers make and your business is gonna be affected by the decisions that the engineers make. And so we see lots of examples of this, whether it's from the cell phone uh, industry. So if you look at organizations that have been able to align the structure of their systems with their business model, they've historically done very well. And if you look at organizations that have not been able to align the structure of their software with their business model, they've not done very well. So there's a number of companies that used to make cell phones that were, that were dominant cell phone manufacturers 10 years ago that are no longer in business today. If you look at, um, at other industries, whether it's an online travel site, so you look at an online travel site and there's a number of technical decisions that, that seem fairly disconnected from the business. So it's the case that, that you need to collect data from a lot of travel partners. So if you go online and you search for a flight for an airline, you think about the number of, of companies that you have to go out and extract data from, it's very significant. And, and that takes a long time. 
And so a customer has a lot of options today in terms of, of searching for flights, whether it's kayak or orbits or Travelocity or what have you. And if one of them tends to be very slow, then it will, it will um, uh, be likely that your customers are going to transition to your competitor. So you need to make sure that that happens very quickly. And usually what you'll do is you'll extract the data and you'll cache it locally in order to provide a much faster response time. But if you cache the data locally, then it's less likely to be correct. So flight schedules change all the time, the cost for flights change all the time, and if you have a local copy, then it's not necessarily going to reflect the latest and greatest uh, schedule and price and availability and so forth. And so customers will also be frustrated by, offering, by being offered a price that they can no longer purchase, or by not being offered the best price or the best option, or by uh, being offered a schedule that no longer exists. And so you have to carefully understand the, the, the needs of your customer, and you have to understand what the options are from a technical perspective, and then you've got to carefully balance those two. So what's the right balance between response time and correctness? And that's really going to depend on the market and, and an understanding of the marketplace. But you need your engineers to understand what the options are and what the alternatives are from a technical perspective. And so again, uh, you'll need to have some interaction.